Okay, so I'm Aidan Can. I would say I'm an actor, a singer, a voiceover, um, whatever you need me to be, I'll, I'll do it. Well, not everything. Um, and yeah, what inspires me, well, the reason I'm an actor is the long story, but I, I didn't really train until after I went to university and uh, I was on the stage one day in the drama sock. We did a production, a Terry Pratchett production, and I remember looking out into the audience and having finishing my degree in French and sociology. And I, you know, I really enjoyed being there. I had a great time. It's just, I realized that I thought I was going to be a journalist. And then I looked out and I thought, well, this is without question the happiest place in the world for me. Um, and then I just quietly came to terms with the fact that I wanted to train as an actor. So then I went to drama school. So I guess I see myself as a performer mm -hmm. and I do want a company with Tracy Martin called Red Bear. And, you know, we, we are, we were just before all of this, all of this, let's call it madness yeah. happened to our world. We were about to shoot a short film. The first one as a company, we'd worked on other people's work before. Obviously Tracy does a lot of writing and I, I do lucky to work on other people's projects too, but we, you know, we just had to pause that, that, that project and we'll do it. We'll do it. And that's the beauty of making your own work. But yeah. Um, one of the things I've concluded though, in this having, I've come home to my parents. I usually live in Dublin. I'm in, in Louth at the moment. There's a big plant. <laughs> I yes. just keep the green in and keeps the mental health in check. Um, I, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, I realised that I miss performing. <laughs> and it's not like I was about to do a big performance soon. I was about to go into rehearsal at the end of April for a production in Belfast, but you know, we don't know what's going to happen to that because they can't officially cancel things or postpone them until a certain date. Yeah. Um, but I realised that, yeah, I, I, I had this, uh, I am an actor and, and, I, and I love that aspect and not to be too typical or, can I say wanky? Yeah. Um, you know, t telling the stories is 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 ultimately is ultimately the name of the game, and it's why I do it. It's probably wanting to be a bit of a show off, being one of the kids wanting some attention, and it's just manifested in this. <laughs> you know. I can ask you because I go back to college there because as so many yeah. people, that kind of how my kind of career progressed, the drum sock and, and the stuff. Like before that, did you have an inkling of being a performer before you went to college? I mean, were you on stage? Were you singing? Um, it's a good question because when you're in a big family of lots of kids and they're all like really close in age, there's a real, in our personalities as a group of people, there's a, everyone, most of us would be classed as singers. And I think that become, that's because you know, there's singers on my mom's side of the family, show bands, and my own, my grandfather was a singer on my dad's side. They would never say they're singers, but they have incredible, incredible voices and really strong um, presence as a people. <laughs> there's a lot of big country men and, and women, and uh, that sounds really bad, but you know what I mean. And they, they had no qualms about getting up and singing at things when they're pushed a little bit, you know. So I come from that kind of house, you know, where everyone goes, go on, sing a song. There's always been that. And I, you can't, I can't disregard that mm -hmm. as part of the story. But I also went, we were born in Newry, which is only up the road from here. But we had really strong Newry accents as kids. And then we, we moved back to where my parent, my dad's from here in Kitty Peninsula. And... 20 minutes makes all the difference when it comes to accents. So my mom was saying, would you like to go to what would have been called elocution at the time? Which I just think is such a wrong thing to say. It's like fixing how you speak. But I went to speech and drama and I actually think it was a secret way of her giving me some time by myself away from my sisters and brothers. And I just loved um, feeling, um, I didn't feel like I, 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 I had to look for attention or anything, but I definitely felt like those classes getting up and saying a poem or learning how to be confident in a different group of people was always going to be the bedrock of why I, I do this now. You know, like I remember playing games and being really shy. You know, half of my family would say I was really shy as a kid. The other half would say I wasn't, but it depended on the context. I see a lot of, of that in my nieces and nephews now. You know, some of them are maybe performers, some are not. 
So that, that kind of progressed. I did fascias and things. And I have such a vivid memory of one of the fish results cards. And it said, Evening has a lovely tone of voice. And the rest was grand. Like I was fine. I wasn't brilliant <laughs> by any means. But I just remember thinking, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then um, I don't think I sang in front of many people until I was about 16. I, I did junior cert for my uh, junior cert music and I had to sing because I knew I could. Yeah. And then I sang at my granny's uh, birthday and everyone went, oh, we have another singer. So that became, you know, I was on the list then of singers. They all feed into each other. And then, then I, I went to university and inevitably joined the Drama Society, but I also was the editor of the newspaper. So there was this sort of like, and I was worked in a local radio station as well at the weekends, presenting and things. So I just took for granted I was going to be a broadcast journalist. But the bit I loved the most and the bit, the bit I was good at was the in the moment things, you know, and I loved the research and I love writing. Wow. But I think that's what happened I, I, and I was going out with an actor for a few years and I think I realized I have to credit him with the fact that I'd never really considered that actors are real people yeah. you know like I grew up with the dad my dad's a farmer and he worked for Aircom my mum was a nurse before she had all of us and you know I don't no, of course I know millions of actors now, let's say, but I didn't know actors or even professional musicians. And if I did, I didn't not recognize them as that. So to, to, to be with somebody and to get to know actors and their struggle, but also the joy and allow and be allowed to want to do that. I think it's not that my parents ever stopped me, but it was just never my reality. Yeah. And I think then I, I quietly admitted it much to my boyfriend at the time's um, dismay. He thought, oh no, two actors. It's never what's a good mix. But. Well, what's interesting what you're saying, a huge part of the drive behind the series is around that actors as real people or musicians as real people or stage managers as real, real people because yeah. they are our neighbours, they, they are our friends, they're yeah. everywhere. You know? And I think sometimes there is a divide between say the public and the artist that's kind of false. And I'm not sure where yeah. Um, can you talk about that happy space and how has that kind of continued, you know, through your career? I mean, you know, and the kind of huge range of roles and work that you've done. Like, mm. you know, is it the rehearsal room? Is it the stage? Is it both? Such a good question. Like, because I, I know actors who say, oh, God, I love the rehearsal room. I choose a rehearsal room over anything. Because you do perform in a rehearsal room. Like, it's not like they're getting away with it. It's not like they're just quietly hiding there. You have to really expose yourself. And I would say that the rehearsal room, as you know, is a very vulnerable place, but hopefully a safe place so that you can make mistakes and look stupid or make big, you know, big, big choices and then work or not work, mostly not work. That's the beauty of it. I would say that uh, I actually just love getting, I love the bit where you're in uh, previews maybe on stage and you realize, aha, there's the sweet spot, we have it. Do you know that you kind of know and what's really worrying is that you think you have it and then the director says afterwards, well, that was a bit too fast tonight, like we have to do another bit of work tomorrow before this is ready for opening. You know, it's like that push and pull, I enjoy that and I, really god you know we're gonna i'm gonna sound like such a nerd but i love the words you know i, I get to play with some of the words i get to play with like tennessee williams or you know um shakespeare you know like the really great people and some incredible new writers as well you get to go oh this is the this is the bit now that feels you know it's quite theatrical like some of the speeches you have to say let's be honest you would never let someone you love go on speak for that amount of time in a very dramatic way but trying to the challenge I enjoy is being on stage trying to make those incredible beautiful poetic uh, pieces sound like a real person yes that's the bit I think where I go oh and I, I, this is why I this is why I do this because you know you just know when it's not working and you definitely well I hope you know when it is because you just feel people leaning in or mm -hmm. leaning back or whatever the sense in the room is and it's because I think they connect to really the human bit of the of it you know and the bit so, that, recently you've kind of you mentioned kind of iconic or you know different types of figures would you move yeah. 
a Blanche Dubois in, you know, Streetcar to, mm. um, you know, Widow Quinn in Playboy. And I'm just... Uh, that's yeah, I mean, like, how did I do it? Or Well, not how, but I'm just, I'm just kind of interested in those very strong women, but from completely, well, are uh, very strong, but from completely, like, yeah. I mean, you're talking about you, your process and, and the sweet spot. I suppose, how do you, for people who say don't know the, the craft, how do you divest one to, to go into to the other and how much, you know, time? Yeah. Do you know what I've realised as well is that, that every single person walking the earth is full of different people. You know, like we, we don't, and I'm not saying that I become, I don't really become any of those characters, obviously. Like if I did think I was, I, that's a different conversation. Um, and I don't believe that that's, I don't believe that I'm a method actor. Do try on the feelings of the of the of the characters, and if I haven't had the same experience as them, I will try and find something close to it and live in it for a few seconds to figure out like what that looks like in me. But like to move from somebody like Blanche, um, I was looking back now. I was really exhausted this Christmas, and probably a bit sad and a bit anxious and depressed. I think it was exhaustion, but that wasn't because you know there was some personal loss as well in our family and and like you know my uncle passed away and you know all of that stuff accumulates and I realized it does exhaust you and it's a beautiful job when you get to play those parts but also I've learned to be aware that you do kind of you do spend yourself doing these making them and then putting them up there every night and then making sure that you don't get sick and making sure that your voice is always okay and you're physically intact so that you don't so you can walk across the stage <laughs> um but working from Blanche and inevitably if you're going to play that role you're going to have to be quite vulnerable and not even quite very vulnerable and very it does tax you and your body you know you're crying a lot or you probably will cry a lot or you'll interp interpret the text where something quite big is happening in your body so your body does sort of think that to some extent that that is happening like logically I know I am not Blanche Dubois god forbid but um, although I do love love the the, the character, um, and I think finding in myself what I have already there there for the taking that I don't need to worry about, you know, like perhaps it's my height or the way I walk and accentuating that, so it's a bit more Blanche to what stuff like that. I, I access um, characters that way, and also working with the people that you're offered to work with, like incredible movement directors movement directors and voice people you know they're just and obviously the directors at the core of that just they really help you figure out what you have that you don't need to worry about that helps you tell the story and then the bits that you need to maybe find that you don't use that often so coming from Blanche into Widow Quinn we didn't want the Widow, Widow Quinn to be uh to be obviously sexy, as in what I'm trying to say is a younger Widow Quinn, because I played Blanche Dubois and Widow Quinn one after the other, and they're both in the text 30, yeah. right? But They've never been but through the ages, we've interpreted these women as women in their late 40s, 50s, even older, you know? And so you're, 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 you're conscious that people have a perception of what this woman, these women should be. With Widow Quinn, we didn't want her to be using her feminine wiles because she was younger. You know, like, I'm doing like an inter interpretation of somebody trying to be sexy. <laughs> There's nothing sexy about it. But, you know, like, you know, not trying to use her sexuality is what we're trying to say. So, so leaning into the fact, a walk that, a walk that didn't make me, I, it meant that I wasn't trying to, use my hips in any certain way so I an, an unapologetic like not apologizing on any level for being there which actually I learned from a different part years ago playing Petruchio as a woman that we as women tend to do that a lot okay so I mean I'm not saying that I apologize for being here but I think our, our body language can lean into that more likely than a man's so like you know like sitting like this taking up as much space as I physically can for ages as Widow Quinn so different to Blanche Dubois who's so aware and so acutely aware of, of, of norms and what's expected of a lady and you know very contained very upright almost like she's wearing a corset in Victorian times um, but not but certainly has you know shapes are everything the, the aesthetic is everything to Blanche 
Widow Queen couldn't give a flying F about aesthetic. You know, like if you saw the pictures of me play this part, you know, the cat, the wig, we, we put, we darkened under my eyes, you know, didn't accentuate any redness, you know, wore lipstick that she, you just, she just, she put it on and it's just for a bit of color, you know, to make a bit of an effort, but you know, like makeup that she's added to over the weeks, not necessarily cleans the mascara stains, that kind of thing. Um, finding a voice that was lower and you know you're working somewhere like the Gaiety Theatre and lucky to work there you realise that you know having a woman's voice travels further in big spaces but you know having to maintain that kind of widow queen sound like down there or like keeping a low and then Blanche is up here so you know <laughs> voice body I could talk about that stuff for, for hours because it's so interesting and it's the crack because yeah, when you know yeah. you have it you have it you know Come here, Adrian, is there is there a something you've seen, whether in whatever art form or a, a performance or a play or a film or a, a exhibition or a piece of work? Mm. Is there a few of them that have kind of I don't mean changed your life in that way, but like that have really inspired you? Just is there a kind of work that you've seen or work that you keep going back to? It could be, mm. it could be a series, and you know. Yeah, it's, you know what? It's like, you know that awful, it's a great question, but you know that it makes you panic and people go, what's your favourite film? You know what's one of my favourite films? And it's so interesting that we're in this, I, I, we did a whole thing on Twitter the other day, loads of friends and were, were uh, declaring their favourite film and using a gif from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine was 28 Days Later. Oh, well, hey. <laughs> you know what I loved about it? I think I was like in my late teens and I went to see it with, to the cinema with my friends. It was the only thing we could see at that point in the evening. We hadn't planned our evening very well, clearly. So everybody was going, oh, let's go and see this thing. I was the only one that just, I, I remember genuinely, and I'm, I've probably exaggerated the memory now, but I remember sitting there and going, oh my God, I didn't actually see any bad guys, but it was so terrifying and also exhilarating. And the acting was so real and raw and, the camera work, I knew that they did it on a certain budget, you know? And I didn't know about budgets then. I didn't consider that, but I was like, that's really clever and really exciting. And I think it may probably planted a seed that didn't really bloom until years later that I could do make stuff, you know? Yeah. And I hadn't considered yet that I could be an actor. Oh my God, like imagine an actor. Like that's crazy. I don't even know one. Yeah. So I was just more, I was so blown away. I remember being my breath been taken away by it. Now I could watch it again now and go, oh, but, but at the time it, it did impact me. And um, I also, in university, I, as I mentioned, I did French and sociology, my two major um, subjects and anthropology was the third. And I, both my thesis in final year were on art. So one was, um, I did a qualitative study about how art school can determine how successful you are as an artist, you know, and you can apply that directly to drama institutions as well and acting and music. Um, I discovered that, yes, it doesn't always mean that you, but like per capita, it will purely on, not purely on, but certainly because you're, you, you leave with the confidence. There's loads of holes, whole, you know, theories. And the other thing was on impressionism in 19th century France and you know, so I, I obviously focused on Monet and talked about Manet as well, inevitably, and Renoir. And, and so I, I've i grown up since then, but I say that my favourite Irish artist is Jack B. Yeats and Louis Le Brocchi. And as a woman, I'm like, there must be a woman in there somewhere. But actually, I just really respond to those those images. That sort of, that especially like it's post-impressionism technically with Jack, Jack Yeats, but just that, the fact that something can make me feel something. It makes me so proud to be part of a, a community that also tries to make people feel something. Yeah. So there's all like, you know, like, and, and, and it's so exhilarating when you find that painting or sculpture or you see it in real life, you've only seen it in books and you go, oh God, that actually feels amazing. Yeah, yeah. To be able to communicate that hopefully to other people through what we do is exciting. God, I'm very, I, Sure. Okay. I mean, it's brilliant. No, and I'm going to let you go in a second. There's one other, other question, um, maybe one and a half. Um, in relation to, say, I'm always interested in how people within the art sector talk to people without outside the art sector about yeah. 
what fires them. Um, and like in the axis we use kind of, you know, like the young girl or boy singing is going through the same process as a professional singer that's on the stage, but no one's saying they're as good at, as each other necessarily, mm. but there's the same creativity in existence there. But sometimes the way our society is set up, they're, they're two very, very different things. And sometimes yeah. people, people who are very creative in their own lives don't see themselves as that. that. And I find that very, very sad in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I've, I've always wondered about how would you advocate for that? Because I think if you advocate for that to the general populace, that will really help the cause of, say, the importance of arts in society and more money. Yeah, that. yeah. Um, isn't it quite incredible when you you see, when you have that moment, that, that sweet spot, let's call it again, uh, where you're in a group of people who don't consider themselves creative, or maybe they're a youth group, and I'm sure you see it all the time, where they all they have that moment of united acceleration. Yeah. You go, oh, this is, this is cool, this is so awesome. And one, recently I did a reading um, at Seen and Heard in Smock Alley, incredible uh, festival, obviously, that just, you know, I think it was a week later when we all started having to dismantle the industry. Um, this woman came up to me in the upstairs bar afterwards and she said, I've never been to theatre before. And, and I was like, okay. And she said, and I loved that. And she was so genuinely excited. And I kept saying to her, okay, awesome. And I was thinking, how do we, how do we, how do we work? How do we build on this? And I was going, have you, would you, would you want to go to some more theatre this week? And she said, yeah. I said, well, this is on in the Abbey and this is on in the gate. Now it's not as cheap as the tickets you got here, but like you won't regret it if you go there or, you know, trying to give her like names and writing them down to places she could go and find more theatre because she was just so gobsmacked by how different it felt for her. Yeah. Two different people came up to me that day about that particular reading. Not about anything other than the fact that they were in a theatre and I happened to be one of the actors and they were going, God, that was great. I, I've never been to the theatre before. And I just going, this is awesome that this is. And as you say, it's just such an exciting moment when you go, ah, you see, if you only knew this, if we, everyone only knew this. Yeah. You know, and it's not going to be like this for everyone. But I bet you it would be for nearly most of them. Absolutely. It's also breaking down that, that presumption, I think, that a lot of us have, that people do know what it's like to go to the theatre. Or that people yeah. have that as part of their life. I mean, one of the things, when I kind of started here, I remember we were doing a lunchtime performance of um, Dermot Bulger's From the Screen Heights. This is back like 15, 16 years ago. Yeah. At the time, there was a man sitting at the front of the door, and all the audience had kind of gone in. And Ray Yates, Men's City Arts Officer, who was the director here at the time, was setting up to him and said, Are you going in? And he goes, What happens in there? And at that moment, I kind, of, I kind of went, That is really, really interesting. Yeah. But how, yeah. how, how would that man know? And but I didn't know what was going on in the theatre before I went to see Doubt in the Abbey, because my friend was doing, was do, I was in university. And I was already performing on stage, but I hadn't really gone to the big productions yet. Like I must have been 18. Maybe it was before university. But I definitely, or college as we say here, I was living in London for years, so I still say uni. <laughs> and so I remember sitting there and watching this play and going, this is kind of unreal. I kind of, and that's another big moment for me. I went, okay, I want to be on those stages where obviously I didn't acknowledge it at the time where every element of the artistry was just top notch. You know, the set, the lighting, the, the acoustics, the acting, the writing, um, the direction. Um, I think Mr. Sheridan might have directed that production. Anyway, um, and I just remember going, okay, this is, this is next level stuff here, you know. And, and I, myself, Tracy, took wrapped the show that you guys hosted for us there we took it to the dock and i had people who'd never seen me act before and i was doing accents that they didn't know could come out of my mouth and they were going i, I really want more of this because they were they love that the music societies in the dock are really off the charts good um but they don't get as many plays like you know plays with two people talking to each other and they were just a bit like can we get more of this you know we don't we don't get to see this and this feels different and it's not a film, like we know that too. And 
yeah, I mean, I feel like I'd love there to be an acknowledgement at the moment of how much art we're consuming unwillingly to get through this time, you oh, know. You know, if there was somebody in the art sector or in the government that have nothing, that don't, uh, don't declare that they're and aren't technically part of the art sector and say, look, just as somebody, you know, as an important person, yeah. I'd like to take the time to acknowledge the fact that a lot of you are probably missing theatre or you're missing the opportunity to go to gigs and, but you are watching Netflix and Amazon Prime and RTE and Channel 4 and most of it is probably going to be dramas and soaps and a lot of these people are freelance and they work really hard to make this and they love it and if we didn't have them we'd run out of it and then ask yourself what that would feel like <laughs> you know because we know that if we don't support an artist we're going to miss that genius the genius among the five you know one in, one in five one in ten whatever it is genius artist we don't like give everyone a chance to be that then how we're going to miss it you know and i we will miss it i think if we're not careful in the next few years we're, we're just we're really doing ourselves out of the opportunity of finding the next you know you name it um marina car you know <laughs> um right that's that's a brilliant way to finish i think that was you actually asked my half question for for me Aileen, yeah. thank, thanks so much for taking part and um, I wish you well in your hibernation. Uh, yeah, I hope to see doing voiceovers from wardrobes, it's uh, very correct. And I hope to see you in the real world uh, very, very soon. Yeah, thanks for giving me a chance to speak to somebody outside my home. No <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thanks, Mark, take care.